Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to AEI. It gives me great pleasure to host what promises to be a wonderful deep dive into the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, nearly two years after the passage of the law. I'm a resident scholar here at AEI, and as many of you may know, over the past several weeks, uh, Erin, my research assistant, and I have been hosting a blog series at AEI titled TCJA Now What? And, and the purpose behind the blog series was to really get academics, policy experts, you know, tax wonks to, to weigh in on how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is really playing out two years after uh, it, it became law. You'll find a link to the series on the event webpage, uh, and all of our speakers today have posted to the series, as well as many other speakers that we've invited, and many other uh, bloggers. Um, as we know, emotions about the tax law uh, vary widely, range widely. For instance, I was just uh, reading, Bill Gale wrote a piece for Tax Policy Center last year titled, Not So Happy Birthday to the Ta TCJA. Ben Castleman and Jim Tankersley of the New York Times uh, wrote a piece titled, Face It, You Probably Got a Tax Cut, and There is a Good Chance You Don't Believe It. And I think that, you know, that, that tells you just how people perceive the bill and the reality of what the bill is. Um, what the article states is that while most people did actually get a tax cut, there was a wide gap between perceptions of the law and, and reality, since few people felt as if they had actually benefited from the law. Now, some of this is truly a result of the tax you know, cut being very small for, for a lot of households. But as the article states, I think what bothers Americans most uh, about the tax system is not that they pay too much or that they got a, a teeny tax cut, but that the corporations and wealthy pay too little. And, uh, and there's this perception that the TCJA largely benefited the wealthy. The law clearly has different implications for different actors in the economy. Companies got the corporate rate cut, but also have to deal with the international provisions. Individuals and households saw changes to the tax rates through marginal cuts in the personal tax rate, um, also expansions of the child tax credit. A lot of high tax income taxpayers uh, got hit by the SALT caps. Pass-through entities are engaged in decoding Section 199A. Budget experts worry about the longer-run fiscal impact of the bill. Tax and accounting professionals are still trying to decipher what the new law means for companies. So clearly, the only thing that's certain about the TCJA is, it, is the uncertainty that it's created. So the mot motivation for this event and for the blog series that we've been running is simply to put together all of these different perspectives, these different voices, to figure out, well, how, what, how is it actually playing out? So there's a lot of noise, uh, and we really want to understand what, does, what did it mean on the ground? What, did it, what is actually happening on the ground? Uh, so a quick run of show, I will moderate the first panel. Uh, unfortunately, Jason Furman had to cancel uh, his being here last minute because of a family medical emergency. Uh, but we have an excellent panel. We've uh, asked Bill Gale to be on the first panel instead of Jason. Glenn Hubbard, Maya McGuinness, and Alan Weard are all on the first panel. And then Elaine Marg of the Urban Institute will moderate the second panel, and I will let her introduce that panel. So I'm going to ask my panel to, to come onto the stage right now. A quick introduction, and please follow along on social media using the hashtag TCJANowWhat. Um, so Bill Gale is the R.J. and Francis Miller Chair in Federal Economic Policy at Brookings, and he's the author of a new book titled Fiscal Therapy, Curing America's Debt Addiction and Investing in the Future. Glenn Hubbard is a professor at Com Columbia University and is now also at AEI as a visiting scholar. Maya McGuinness is president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, through the committee's project, Fix Us, she also runs a project on the future of the economy, technology, and capitalism. And finally, Alan Weard is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He has also been a visiting scholar at the US Department of Treasury's Office of Tax Analysis. So I'm going to welcome my first panel on board. Um, and let's just begin, you know, Quick take on how you think what's actually going on with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Bill, I'm going to start with you. Just a very quick one to two before we get into details about. Sure. Uh, so let's divide this into things that have happened and things that haven't happened. Uh, what has happened is that revenues have fallen significantly. 
Uh, what has happened is we've had enormous uh, buybacks, and we've had very big tax cuts uh, for high-income households, some for middle-income households. What hasn't happened is the growth rate of the economy has not uh, been altered uh, noticeably. So that'd be my quick summary. Ben? See, I thought when Jason wasn't coming, I would just get his time. <laughs> well, look, I, I have a somewhat different view. Let's ask ourselves, why did we have the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in the first place? There were a couple of pressures, one in the economics profession, one in the world. In the profession, different views about how important the response of capital accumulation itself is to taxation. The original harburger style models were quite different. And in the world itself, the notion of increased corporate capital mobility leading a lot of uh, interest to focus on the corporate tax and not just shareholder level taxes that many uh, legal and economic scholars have done for a long time. That's why we, we got here. The initial response of investment, which is, should be the principal variable of interest if you're cutting corporate taxes, was indeed positive. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors did uh, very interesting work here. Kevin Hassett, who was then the chair, presented it at the American Economics Association meeting. A colleague of, and I have done uh, using microdata, building on some tools Kevin Hassett and I developed some years ago, uh, microdata responses that are also quite similar. That investment boom has been attenuated. And what has happened, I think, in public policy is a risk premium from the ultra erratic policy we're seeing from the White House that has crowded out a lot of the gains from the, the tax bill. A lot of this we're going to have to wait and see. It's not quite like Zhou Enlai's comment on the French Revolution, but I think it's probably too early to call it and give it a final grade. Um, okay, well, first I'll just say congratulations on the blog series. If people haven't looked at it yet, it's really interesting. And going through all of the different takes, I think it's such a great way to kind of analyze public policy, ask a question, and crowdsource the answers from a bunch of different yeah. experts. It's really fun. Um, I'll just pull out two observations since we'll dig deeper into all of them. The first is that I think the way that we did tax policy and kind of the divide of what's happened to the economy, what's happened to the fiscal environment, shines a light on this tension that exists, which is we are going to need to do everything possible to promote economic growth in this country. We have huge demographic headwinds. Growth is going to be slower going forward than it's been before. And we really need smart, comprehensive economic growth policy. Um, and what is frustrating to me, and you'll hear a theme throughout, is how that has become divorced from smart fiscal policy instead of understanding that smart fiscal policy is part of a comprehensive growth policy. So there are many things that I like and we'll talk about in the tax cut that I think had to happen and some good things that did happen, but to have them happen with a big debt finance tax cut undermines so much of the potential benefit. The second thing that I'll mention, and this is what I chose to write about because there were so many good digging into the data in the blogs, but I think we didn't uh, fully appreciate how much the way the tax bill was done would poison the political environment in a way that makes it so much harder to do any of the tough choices we need to do on the tax or spending side going, <coughs> going forward. Um, and so I'll probably weave that into my answers as well. But I think that once you've had a one party huge bill that reflects a priority for that party that is almost purely, not purely because there were a bunch of offsets, but adds tremendously to the national debt, you create an environment where the belief that we have to do something to bring the debt down is completely gone. And instead, the other party says, OK, fine, if you do that, then I'm going to this for all, this for all, and this for all, which is where we are right now. So I think the political economy effects um, rival the fiscal effects in terms of the negative parts. So I think there's good and bad in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The corporate rate cut, I think, was, uh, it was long overdue to change the 35% federal rate. Uh, really 39% when you include the average state and local corporate tax rate. I think in today's globalized economy, that really was an unviable rate. And so that's certainly a welcome step. I uh, would echo certainly Maya's concern about the impact on the deficit and the long run fiscal imbalance. Uh, you know, Congress obviously chose not to adopt offsetting tax increases or spending cuts. Um, and so uh, that probably is the most harmful legacy of it. Uh, two other comments about it. I guess one is that it was uh, poorly drafted. Uh, we've seen dozens of, there's dozens of errors in there. I mean, the Joint Tax Committee has identified, I guess, 70 some technical corrections. Beyond that, beyond just the 
cases of drafting errors, there's also just many provisions that are ambiguous, that are not specified well. That's certainly true for many of the multinational provisions. It's true for the pass-through uh, business provision and for some of the others. And I do think that it has created some degree of instability in tax policy in the upcoming years between the fact that it was passed just with the support of one party, uh, the fact that some of the provisions are set to expire, uh, at the end of 2025 or at various other dates. Some provisions are actually set to become tighter in future years, and it's unclear whether Congress is willing to let that happen. Um, and then, of course, we, it leaves us with an even bigger fiscal imbalance, which means that we know the tax and budget policy changes of some kind are going to have to be made, and you certainly might expect that changes to the TCJA would be part of that. I'm going to step back a little bit to before the bill was actually passed. Uh, let's go back to summer, the summer of 2017. We were seeing various versions of bill, you know, being marked up and different provisions coming in. And even then, I think there, there were some things that I think a lot of us would have been on board with. Alan, you mentioned the corporate rate reductions because of the competitiveness issue. Um, were there things that you sort of provisions in the bill that you liked, some that you didn't like? Were you glad that some of them made it in, some of them didn't? Uh, just take us back to before the bill actually became law. You know, there was so much debate about what was going on. What was your thinking at that time? You know, which, which provisions were going to work out great for, for the country and which, were, which ones were not? Alan, I'm going to start with you or Maya. Because, you know, what's the, what was the sort of the economic basis for doing a lot of what we saw come out of the DCJA? You go ahead. Okay, sure. Well, so I think the economic basis for the corporate tax cut was certainly the clearest uh, um, issue. And we expected, of course, that such a dramatic reduction in the corporate tax rate would increase the volume of investment in the United States, uh, which with higher, larger capital stock would make workers more productive and over time would lead to an increase in the level of wages. Uh, those effects, of course, were never going to be as large as some of the more enthusiastic supporters claimed they would be, um, and they certainly weren't going to occur overnight. I mean, there's a debate going on now, of course, as to whether that investment increase has materialized or not. I think it's certainly fair to say that it hasn't been as large or dramatic or quick as one might have expected, uh, but I do think it is you know, too early to really draw a definitive conclusion on that. You know, I think that one of the other attractive features of the law is that it did curtail the uh, tax preference for owner-occupied housing. It mostly did that indirectly by increasing the standard deduction. Um, it's not the ideal way to do that because it really curtailed that tax preference sort of in the middle of the income distribution while leaving it intact at the top, which is not the, the way you'd really want to approach it. Nevertheless, on balance, having that, uh, that preference curtailed, I think, is something most economists would welcome, even though I note that it is not something that most Republican lawmakers or the president see fit to uh, talk about when they discuss the law. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I have actually a really super, very similar answer, which is I think the corporate rate definitely needed to come down. I was very pleased that it did come down. I think it probably came down more than it needed to, but I don't think the corporate tax is the future of, of the tax base. Um, and I also have never really uh, liked the lack of transparency that there is in terms of who actually pays the corporate tax. I prefer more transparent taxes. But, but my favorite parts are the, the big tax expenditures that were curtailed, the changes to the home mortgage interest deduction, and just to make myself really unpopular, which is how you are when you're working on deficit issues all the time, <laughs> I, I love ending the state and local tax deduction. Yeah, I think it's exactly. terrific. And I think I was amazed that they made as much progress as they did in changing some of those tax expenditures that have been third rails. And there was much less pushback than I would have thought. State and local, still, there is plenty of pushback. But um, I think having a discussion about those and other tax expenditures that we should be reforming was much, much, it ended up much better than I thought it would have. That was great. Glenn. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think that uh, there was an opportunity, and indeed in some early drafts going back to early Ways and Means Committee work, to think about even bolder, more serious tax reform, uh, moving to a business cash flow tax uh, and the work that was done on destination-based cash flow taxes. I think that's important. I still think we're going to have those discussions because this tax bill is going to be opened up again. And I had hoped that would be where we would go. Now, the corporate rate cut is still a good idea. On the individual side, though, we have much more of a mishmash on the business taxation. I certainly agree that the state and local tax uh, going away, the salt going away, and the limits on home mortgage interest 
uh, indirect that they may be are still are still good policy. But I think on the individual business side, we had a real missed opportunity yeah. for for reform. And then, of course, originally in the discussions, pay fors included things like possibly a carbon tax, which I always thought yeah. was a bit of a political stretch. But border adjustments were not, and would have been part of a cash flow tax scheme. But none of that, of course, came to pass. Uh, well, I. I um... I don't remember the reflective introspective period of, <laughs> of, of TCJA. It was too fast, yeah. uh, uh, so, but but going along with the question, uh, I like the restriction on the mortgage interest deduction. I've written about that elsewhere. Obviously, we need to bring the corporate rate down, and uh, uh, the international provisions, flawed they though they may be were directed at real issues with base erosion and profit shifting. So uh, there's definitely some good in the, in the TCJA. Um, so now turning to how it's actually playing out, which is the growth and investment impacts, and, and a lot of our bloggers sort of commented on how we're <clears> not seeing much sign in the data for the growth and investment impacts that were presumed to be part of the TCJA. Uh, Jason Furman wrote a blog saying the macro data say not much uh, is happening. Uh, and you had a similar take on it, Bill, which is that we're not seeing the growth impacts. Um, so, so where do you all stand on what's actually playing out on the ground? All right. Uh, so let's start with the short run. You had the tax cut. You had a big budget deal in 2018 that was then basically extended in 2019. Uh, you had sort of favorable movements in oil prices that helped. Uh, investment, and then you, of course you have the tariffs and the uncertainty about policy pushing things down. So it's not easy to discern a, a, the effect uh, in the short run, uh, but as Jason noted, the growth rate has basically been the same the six quarters after TCJA uh, as the six before. Uh, in the long term though, I think um, you know, you can get away from the, the current policy vicissitudes. And CBO, for example, estimates that output will be uh, a half a percentage point higher by the end of the decade than it otherwise would have been because of TCJA. That's output. National income uh, will be only a tenth of a percent higher because the investment flows that are coming in now have to be paid back. And once you consider depreciation, net national income will be basically unchanged from, from what it would have been. So I think the prospects for long-term growth effects, uh, at least as, as written out by CBO, are virtually nil. Glenn, you said the TCJ is progress, not perfection. Um, yeah, it's, it's not perfection for many reasons, some of which I, I already mentioned, but I do think it's progress because of the corporate rate cut. And I do think we did see early on in both the macro data and, as I said, in micro data as well, investment responses. Bill notes quite correctly, so much is going on in the world, uh, particularly I would highlight the policy uncertainty that directly if you looked at a user cost of capital, you're adding in a risk premium from White House policy uncertainty that is taking away some of the gains from the White House's own <laughs> tax cut, bizarrely, bizarrely enough. So I, I don't think you can figure that out. I don't think the corporate rate cut was ever going to change the world in terms of the future of American economic growth one direction or another, but it strikes me we were originally on the path we thought we should be on, and I have every reason to believe that will continue if the policy uncertainty abates. And Maya, you said that, again, you were in favor of the corporate rate cuts, um, but you were worried about the deficits. Um, how do you see, like, what's the long-term economic growth potential of the DCJA. Yeah, so as has been said, it's impossible to pull out what the effects are because yeah. there's so many other things going on. One other that, that wasn't mentioned, but monetary policy obviously is going through a, a huge different period. So to figure out what would have happened otherwise right. is impossible. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that as predicted, what we've seen is an increase, a small increase in short-term economic growth. And my guess is, like most of the models predicted, that is not going to last for particularly long, that that did not make enough changes that will persist certainly not for the kind of 10-year period that where people are talking about growth increasing for. Um, 
And the revenue, despite there being some sort of sad attempts to write that the revenue is, that this is still on course to pay for itself or it's going to, um, you know, and I laugh, but it's really sad. It's really one of the things that's kind of an insult to public policy, the stories that have been told about how this would pay for itself or maybe we're in the midst of it still about to. Um, so all that has happened in terms of um, the models expecting there to be a short boost in growth and then a long significant period where it's very, very small and the revenue loss is significant, which is what we've seen and rates are basically, and, and revenues are below where they were expected to have been. Um, I, I think shows the long, our ability to, to create a policy for long-term economic benefit was certainly, this was an opportunity that was massively missed. Um, and I don't think that building a growth strategy that is almost dependent on thinking about short-term stimulus measures at the wrong part of the business cycle is ever going to work for us. And if we start to feed that as a political um, frame for how to do economics, we're going to get ourselves into even more trouble. And Alan, you mentioned, so initially when the TCGA passed, there was all this discussion about, oh, companies are using the money for stock buybacks and worker bonuses, maybe, but you know that's not really how we expect the corporate tax cut to play out. So what do you think is you know, the short term and the long run of the TCJ? How, how should we sort of analyze the TCJ? Well, I think investment is the key variable to look at. I mean, the economic mm -hmm. story is you know, pretty straightforward that we expect with a lower user cost of capital, you'll see more investment in the United States, bigger capital stock, more productive workers, and, and then higher wages. Uh, so a lot of the debate so far has really been you know, misdirected. Uh, what we need to be doing is trying to figure out whether investment is higher than otherwise would have been. And for the reasons that have already been discussed, that's kind of hard to do. We certainly haven't seen, I guess, the dramatic upsurge in investment that I think we might have, have expected or that I might have expected, uh, at least to this point. And we don't know whether it's been offset by other factors or whether it's been delayed or, or whether really investment is less sensitive to the user cost. Um, I think you know, time will, will maybe tell on that. Uh, maybe we'll never know because we never will be able to see what would have happened without the, uh, the tax cut. But a lot of the debate has really been misdirected, and I think both supporters and opponents really uh, share some blame there. The notion has arisen that if you give the corporations money, they will just like give some of it to workers. And if, of course, if that was what the model was going to happen, uh, you'd expect like the wage increases to be instantaneous. And supporters shot themselves in the foot when hundreds of companies, as a PR gimmick, said, oh, these bonuses that we're giving to workers on a one-time basis, those are due to the tax cut. And uh, the supporters said, the tax cut is working. Uh, it is raising wages just the way we said. Well, clearly not, because you, there's no time for the capital stock to have built up yet and workers to become more productive. Um, and so then, of course, they left themselves open to people saying, well, look, the, the effects here are actually, you know, these bonuses are really small. They're one time, mostly. We haven't seen an increase in aggregate wages yet. You know, why is it? I mean, four months after the uh, task was passed, someone you know, wrote, workers are waiting and waiting for those wage increases. And, you know, they just <laughs> haven't happened yet. And, you know, again, obviously, it's just rejecting the tax cut on grounds that certainly never should have been put forward as what it was going to do. So just can, I, can I add? Yeah, so, absolutely. Alan pointed out the, the, the bonuses and how uh, they're not long lasting, but they actually, in an odd way, they actually were due to the tax cut. Because of the rate Because they change, could deduct yeah. the, bon the bonus yeah. at a 35% rate in 2017, rate, yeah. but only a 21% rate in 2018. Right, the fact that they were paid when they were paid instead of a few months later. Yeah, no, I'm not disagreeing <laughs> right. with due the substance the tax of your cut. comments. So yes, that's right. We can give the tax cut some credit on that. That yeah, <laughs> that's right. It sped up by a, a few months boost, yeah. some bonuses. So that's, uh, can I yeah. make a tangential point, which I, yeah. I think a lot about in the tax policy debate and also in healthcare debate, um, and this is a, a point that will only appeal to economists, basically, but we do such a poor job of explaining how economics is supposed to yeah. work. And we are losing, when there is a platform around tax reform or health care reform, the opportunity to explain how things work. And instead, mm -hmm. we skip completely, skip that completely. We let a highly polarized and partisan environment do the talking. Um, mm -hmm. And we're doing a terrible job of educating people about how policy oh, works and how it should work. And then we create false expectations, and the policies become increasingly worse. So I don't know how you beam these, these <laughs> talks out and get people all around the country to be fascinated to listen to tax policy <laughs> panels. Yeah. Um, it's 4%, I think, the number yeah. Yeah. of people but, who are interested. You know, it really is a problem that yeah. the false promises lead to the wrong expectations that lead to the wrong policy designs, and it keeps getting worse because of that. And, that. and that's a great segue to my next question, which is, 
that the you know the fundamental basis for doing the corporate tax reform was the the way in incidence on workers essentially like how how much of a corporate rate cut would be passed on to workers so corporate tax incidence was a big issue and you know we got a lot of claims out of the white house about how much worker wages are going to go up as a result of the of the rate cut Kimberly Clausing, who also wrote a blog for our series, says that the TCJ was never about workers. Glenn, I'm going to turn to you. I just think that's wrong. I mean, I, and it's not that it, that its designers had workers only in mind, yeah. but again, go back to the economics of what was happening in a world uh, of global capital mobility. A lot of the uh, ec- the incidence of the corporate tax would fall on labor. And that's not just a conjecture. You've done work in this. I've done work in this area. Uh, My own work would suggest smaller effects than what the White House suggested, but still there. Uh, And it's, uh, I think it's a reasonable channel uh, to believe. And it's not whether you, quote, did it for workers. It's just how the economy works. Higher investment, higher capital, higher productivity, higher wages. All you need to believe there is a competitive labor market to get the answer. Bill, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I'll just, uh, Michael Etlinger, who's the director of the policy school at New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire, posted something on Twitter the other day uh, saying basically he doesn't know all this fancy economics. He just knows that you don't see workers clamoring for corporate tax cuts, and you do see corporations (laughs) clamoring for corporate tax cuts. So uh, I think everything Gwen said is right qualitatively. Uh, But really, if you want to help workers, there's probably more direct ways and cost-efficient ways to do it than cutting the corporate tax, which not only uh, the good part of the corporate tax cut requires, you know, changes in investment over over time, and there are a lot of steps that have to go through. The bad part of the corporate tax cut is it gives a windfall gain to all investments made in the past because the corporation's income this year is fundamentally based on investments that made in the past. So Glenn and others have been leaders in emphasizing that investment incentives uh, can let you maintain the tax rate on investments made in the past, but give better incentives to make new investments. Uh, they're basically more efficient in that regard than corporate tax cuts. So um, uh, I don't doubt there's, there's some help for workers in the corporate tax cut, but I think if we want to focus on workers, there'll be much better ways to do Can it. Can I come in yeah. and say, because it's a yes but to what you just said. I, I thank you for the citation, but it's, no. it's, very, <laughs> it's very incomplete because for some decisions that are lumpy, you, you're quite right for continuous decisions like how many machines do I put in my plant here today, but where I put something in zero one type decisions are mm. fundamentally affected by the rate itself. So I think one reason business people spend a lot of time on this wasn't just a, uh, about windfalls, but about decisions that really are rate dependent. So, I mean, I think fine. that I think Glenn and Bill really are both right that there is yes some there is some role for the rate cut, uh, as Glenn said, but as Bill said, there is also a big windfall for the past investments. One thing that Alex Brill, who you'll hear from later this afternoon, and I recommended before the tax cut was adopted was that the rate cut could have been phased in over time. Yeah. And if you give time for it to gradually take effect, you're preserving most of the incentive effects for the new investments while limiting the amount of the windfall that goes to the old investments. Now, Congress and the president obviously chose not to follow that advice. I, you know. um, (laughs) If they read the piece. Yeah, right. (laughs) By the way, Jeb Bush's tax plan, which I have some passive familiarity with, did exactly that. And part of it was about revenue and not having such an expensive tax plan. And part of it was about incentives. But somewhere that got left on the cutting room floor. (laughs) Maya, yeah, I, I think if you're thinking about the question of how you help workers, there's also a multi-step process where you can think about which policies would do the most to promote growth, and then if they won't be distributed as you want them to be on their own solely, you can also partner that with other policies. I would not say that the, the portion that we did on the individual tax side was the right partnering, but um, I, I don't know if lowering the corporate tax rate was the best thing to promote growth, but I believe it can be growth enhancing. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, better if it's coupled with uh, deficit neutral than, than deficit financed. But then you can do, take other measures to make sure that that goes to where you want, which I think we should do more in our policy as well. I think the other thing, um, I think what a lot of the debate on the TCGA misses is that there was more to the TCGA than, than just the rate cut. Right? On the international, like on the corporate tax provisions, we saw 
for the first time sort of a worldwide minimum tax through guilty. Uh, companies now have to pay a one-time repatriation tax. Um, there are lots of new provisions, you know, limitations on net interest deductibility and so on. I think that those base broadening measures are often not a focus of discussion. Um, Dhamika Dharmapala, who's at Chicago, U Chicago, writes for our blog that the TCJ is likely to increase resources expended by firms on tax planning, even if the amount of profit shifted were to fall. And Mindy Hersfeld writes that although the immediate impa impact may be reduced US tax revenues, the long-term impact may be the protection of a global corporate tax base. So if you look at the overall sort of corporate tax package, you know, where do you think companies are, are landing? Are they better off? You know, we only hear about the rate cut. Clearly, that's a huge benefit to companies. Um, but there are also all these other international tax provisions that are super complicated. And you talk to firms, and they're still figuring them out. So where do you think companies are on net? Do we know? Uh, are they much better off? Are they? And do you think profit shifting and all the other stuff that we wanted to deal with is affected? Um, what happens to tax planning? Uh, and I'm going to ask you to speculate, because I know that a lot of companies still haven't figured it out. But I think these were all steps in the right direction. Bill was right. I think that it's certainly not perfect or anything close to it, but it was a serious attempt mm -hmm. to get at base erosion, because that had been a legitimate tax policy concern right. uh, as well. Companies will be liking or not liking, depending on their personal situations and you know what markets in which they sell, how capital intensive they are. It's 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 very, very hard to know. There were other approaches that could have been taken, but I think these are still very constructive. What I've heard from folks, and this is more sort of stories from members of the board or, or executives, um, is that they're very happy about the corporate tax rate. They yeah. will whisper, um, it was probably even more than we needed. Yeah. Um, and um, they're ta it's, it's very complicated and working yeah. through it, you sort of see, hear much more about the negative than the appreciative part, right? But the negative is certainly that it wasn't crafted perfectly and it doesn't make sense and trying to figure, out, figure it out is, ex is incredibly exhausting. But the main thing is that so much about what we needed tax reform for was to add certainty to the tax code. And yeah. the fact that there are these expiring provisions and that it is becoming the way that we make these things more and that adds so much more uncertainty I've certainly heard a lot of people say, I would have taken less of a tax cut and for the certainty, which is one of the motivating forces. Yeah, the international provisions, I think you have to distinguish. We now have three uh, new tax regimes, each with their own acronym or name, the guilty, the BEAT, and the FIDI or FDII. There's still, I think, I don't think the tax community is settled on how to pronounce that one. Uh -huh. That may be the least of the provision's <laughs> problems. Uh, the, the guilty provision is a worldwide minimum tax. That idea has been around for a while, and I think you can certainly see how that can be effective in curbing base erosion. It's got a lot, of, there's pros and cons to the concept, and then there's also issues around exactly how it was done. There's some drafting ambiguities in there or gaps that were left that, that Treasury, you know, may is trying to fill by regulation, which they may or may not really have the the right to do. On the other hand, I think the other two provisions. I mean, the beat is also supposed to be to prevent base erosion. It's a completely arbitrary uh, tax that really doesn't uh, make any sense. The FIDI is like a mercantilist export subsidy that probably violates international treaties. The the uh, the the beat provision probably does too. So I don't think, and I think the multinationals are really. Um, have found a great deal of complexity in this. And I mean, the problem is not, oh, yeah, you know, gosh, they've got to incur some expense, but it's uh, the fact that this does thwart their uh, real business activity. I mean, I think there's at least anecdotal accounts that multinationals were really putting a hold on a lot of their activities until they could actually just understand and figure out these provisions. I think the, the FIDI and the beat just seem to materialize in that bill almost from nowhere. And it's not yeah, really clear where they came from, and they certainly were not well designed or well drafted. So I think those, you know, that two thirds of the new international regime really should probably be given pretty, you know, low grades. Even if you think that guilty, uh, you know, is uh, is maybe a more sensible step. The one thing we have done that makes good sense is that <clears throat> we are no longer taxing foreign earnings when they're repatriated. Uh, we, we no longer treat repatriation as the taxable event. So we don't have this artificial incentive to avoid repatriation. Instead, we either tax the foreign earnings when they occur through guilty, or we don't tax them at all. And that, it, you know, that clearly makes, makes sense, yeah. So the, just to follow up on that, the, the ending of the taxation upon repatriation and the deemed repatriation uh, uh, is a good policy. 
but uh, I hope it's clear to everyone that the money, the overseas profits, were not, you know, sitting in a vault in in uh, <laughs> the the. Uh, Ukraine, just to pick a country. <laughs> uh, they were uh -oh. they were in bank accounts in in New York banks and being lent out into the economy. So, un unleashing them doesn't generate a big new investment boom in the United States. It just shifts around who holds bonds and who holds who holds equities. Uh, on the other provisions, uh, I think the key is they are enormously complicated, much more complicated than people thought. Uh, tax notes has sort of created a cottage industry of writing about all the different interactions between guilty and beaten and fitty and everything else. And uh, I couldn't hope to summarize it except that it's complicated. I do want to emphasize what Alan said about beat. Uh, a company that's doing everything right is pricing at arm's length, everything like that, uh, is completely above board, just has a global supply chain. They will be penalized for absolutely no reason under, under the BEAT rules. Uh, the foreign direct uh, intangible invest, investment is basically our patent box, which is just basically as bad as everyone else's patent box. And then uh, guilty would be better if it were on a per country basis rather than a basket basis. Uh, and there, there's a whole lot more to be said about this. I think when it's time to re-examine uh, taxes. The international side will be one of the targets. But it's important to appreciate these are all totally new regimes. Uh, so it's true, as Alan said, as I've said, that this was a rushed uh, procedure. But even if it hadn't been, there would have been, there would have been lots of complications. Uh, on the individual side as well, you know, we saw base broadening. Maya, you mentioned the salt cap and limitations on mortgage interest deduction, and, and yet we see a lot of states sort of pushing back against, uh, you know, this kind of base broadening. Uh, where do we stand on that? Are, are they sensible ideas? Are they things we need to, you know, ramp up? What, what do we do? On the individual side, I pretty much love any, any base yeah. broadening you can have and would we'll push for more whenever there's an opportunity. But again, I think that was a good start, that there were so many other things that were distracting people that actually the pushback has been less than I would have expected, though the state and local will persist, and I bet there will probably be some repealing of those changes. Um, you know, the tax base is terrible on the individual side. It's not great on the corporate side. There's more we could do, but we should have linked. The problem is if you link the giveaways without the cleaning up are the hard parts, they'll never happen on their own. And so we should have linked the base broadening along with the tax reform. And that could have been one of the parts that was more pro-growth, actually. I think limiting a lot of those tax expenditures would be growth enhancing. I think the base broadening, it's a mixed bag. I mean, I think EMI is right on balance that we do need more base broadening than we've had. But we don't need more across the board. And there's good base broadening, there's bad base broadening. Some of the base broadening in the TCJA was bad. Uh, it's a fundamental principle of tax policy, it's a fundamental requirement of what economists call production efficiency, that costs of earning income should be deductible. And the TCJA really took a step backwards on that. Um, it repealed the deduction for employee business expenses and repealed the moving expense deduction. Um, now those are, in many cases, mixed business personal expenses, so full deductibility may not have been right, and so there would have been room to improve there. But uh, to outright scrap those deductions, I think, was a mistake and just seemed to be base broadening for the sake of base broadening without thinking about why base broadening is normally a good idea. The biggest part of other base broadening that was done was through the enlargement of the standard deduction, which just caused people to stop claiming itemized. the itemized mm -hmm. deduction. And it, again, I think that's, you can easily make the case that's good on balance, but it's really um, not, it's far from the ideal way to do it. It means that you have these itemized deductions, these tax preferences that are still in place for high income people, but not for the rest of the population. You have maybe 12% of the population itemizing now instead of 30 some percent. And so only 12% are claiming deductions for charitable giving. The rest of the population has no incentive on the margin to give it to charity. I mean, is it a sensible policy to say that charitable giving deserves uh, a public, public support if it's done by that 12%, but not by anybody else. And curtailing the owner preference for owner-occupied housing. 
If you were doing that from scratch, you certainly wouldn't want to preserve the incentives for owner-occupied housing at the very top so that the mansions are still getting a uh, tax preference, uh, but then taking it away at lower levels. So I, I think it's a mixed bag. You can argue it's better than you might have expected. I wonder if you could also flip it, though, and say that as fewer people are itemizing, then there's a lower incentive to create more new tax expenditures, mm -hmm. which is can one of Congress's yeah. favorite things can to I do. Jump in on that? So. I think one of the single best things about the TCJ is that it marks the beginning of the end of the mortgage interest right. deduction. Mm -hmm. It used to be this was a middle class birthright. And I remember Sam, Paul Samuelson in the 90s saying, you'll never get the flat tax because people will never give up the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, now only 8% of households take the mortgage interest deduction. And it's, as Alan mentioned, it's mainly uh, upper middle class and very high income uh, households. So the politics of it have changed dramatically. And uh, uh, I think we could see in the future a movement to get rid of the deduction and replace it with something that might be a first-time home buyer subsidy uh, or something like that, which would be probably more effective in raising home ownership rates and less expensive uh, uh, also. So I just want to echo Alan's point. One of the great things about being on this panel is that so many things I want to say get said by other people, so I don't have to say them. <laughs> but there is good base expansion and bad base expansion, and there's a mix here. Uh, it's not just mindless. It shouldn't yeah, I, be just mindless tax to everything. I agree on the housing point, but I want to pick up on something else that Alan said that I think is very important. Going forward, we probably will at some point need to raise more revenue from affluent taxpayers than we do today. That means higher average tax rates, at, for sure, for those people. It needn't mean higher marginal tax rates if we do it in the right way. So I think we want to, it's an odd focus of base broadening to have done so much outside the top. And I think there's more that could be done for affluent taxpayers. This is a great segue to a question I've been wanting to sneak into our conversation on the TCJA, which is on the wealth tax and on, you know. That's not what I meant. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Emmanuel Saez and uh, Gabriel Zuckman's new book, Triumph of Injustice, which talks about you know, imposing a wealth tax on the super wealthy, 0.1%, 0.01%. Um, but they also mention in their book that a big reason why the top 400 are paying effective tax rates that are lower than the bottom 50% or something is because of the corporate tax cut being primarily a tax cut for, you know, the richer, richest people um, in the U.S. So where do we stand on the idea of a wealth tax? Do we think that base broadening or having a bigger tax base in, could include a wealth tax at some point? I think it's a very bad idea. And I'll, I'll start philosophically. The, the late David Bradford, wonderful tax economist, always had a great story about wealth taxes. That if you imagine two very successful people with identical lifetime incomes, and one saves and invests, the other uh, is a spendthrift, the wealth tax punishes the former, not the latter, which is an odd thing. I know these authors use words like justice, but having taken Rawls' class as a graduate student, I thought most contemporary theories of social justice would have been uh, more like a maxi-min, let's bring the bottom up, not a mini-max, let's drag the top down. Now to economics. Uh, anything we want to do to get at the issues that we might raise we could do in the income tax. So for example, if your reason for wanting a wealth tax is untaxed wealth, well, that's probably accumulated capital gains that are getting transferred at death. So that probably means switching to carryover basis. If you want to reform the capital gains tax, do that. But I just don't see the need. Then to the issue of the wealth tax itself, it creates some um, enormous tax planning problems. Uh, virtually every country that's tried it uh, has pulled it back entirely or has wealth taxes at a tiny fraction. And just to close with a thought, is it even a 2% rate, is that a big number or a small number? Well, the way I think about it, it's confiscatory. You ask, well, how could Elizabeth Warren just says, it's just two cents. Well, think about it. If I stacked up $50 million in a penny on this table right here, so I would be in the zone for the wealth tax, the right way to think about the expected return on that is not in for marginal returns at all, would just be the safe rate of interest. The risk premium is just accounting for risk. The safe rate of interest in the United States is well under 2%. 
So I, I just think these, whether you start them on a philosophical ground, a practical ground, an economic ground, it's just a complete non-starter. I think this is a very important point about thinking about the wealth tax rates. And it is, you know, 2% sounds low, but again, that's actually a misstatement because the rate is 2% per year. You cannot state a wealth tax rate without having a unit of time, either explicit or implicit. You know, you don't need that for an income tax, right? If you have a 20% income tax over the course of a year, you pay 20% of the year's income. Over the course of a decade, you pay 20% of the decade's income. The rate is 20%, no matter what the time period may be. But of course, with a wealth tax, a flow of tax is being imposed on a stock of wealth. And so the correctly stated rate would be 2% per year or 3% a year for billionaires. And then, of course, in the Sanders plan, you're up to 8% a year for a very tiny group of uh, multi uh, billionaires. Um, and yes, the right thing to do is compare that to a rate of return. Uh, Glenn is right that it is the safe rate of return that you should be looking at under broad assumptions. Even if you were to mistakenly look at a risky rate of return, rates like you know 8% a year are still you know, very high and even 3% a year is very high. So the question is, you know, why do you need to do the wealth tax? And I think that even if, let's just stipulate for the moment that you really did agree that we need to be imposing more tax on the very you know, most well-to-do households, the top 400 and, and those just below them. Um, I still don't think you really need to go to a wealth tax. You can do that within the income tax system. Um, carryover basis is kind of a modest step forward to say, when you die, your uh, heirs will eventually have to pay tax on the gain that accrued during your lifetime. But you could go one step further and say the gain will be taxed at, at death. But you could actually go further than that, and that's to go to to mark to market taxation for publicly traded assets, where you're taxed every year on the gain that accrues. For assets that are not publicly traded, where they're hard to value, which is a big problem for the wealth tax, the income tax can sidestep that in large part. You could tax the gains when they're realized, but impose an interest charge to reflect, based on how many years you held it, to reflect the fact that the gain wasn't taxed year by year. It's an imperfect approach, but you can do that. And so it seems to me that you know, if you just assume for the sake of argument that we need to, to increase taxes there, you would have a better way to do that uh, just by changing the way uh, that capital gains are taxed. You would have probably avoid the constitutional issues surrounding a wealth tax. You would avoid most of the valuation issues because under the approach I've outlined, you wouldn't need to value anything until it was sold. Or in the case of publicly, you, you, would, you would value the publicly traded every year, which is easy to do. The non-publicly traded, you wouldn't have to value until they were sold or until the person died. Uh, much different than trying to value everything every year. So. Yeah, that would really be so easy. If I could just add a, a, a point on that too, there is another sort of in the weeds problem with the wealth tax. If you're taxing capital income, there's an insurance feature of the tax system that just goes away if you're taxing the level of wealth. So it would be a less efficient way as well as getting the same tax. Uh, let me just add there. So I think Sias and Zuckman deserve a lot of credit for getting the wealth tax sort of on the table as a as a reasonable topic. Their argument basically is a utilitarian one uh, that the marginal utility, the social value of the marginal utility of consumption of the extraordinarily wealthy is basically zero. And uh, they go farther and argue that, that uh, the extremely wealthy have created negative externalities via undue political influence, via rent seeking, and so on. And there's some evidence the lower rates lower rates at the top have generated more uh, rent-seeking activity. So they're interested in going after uh, the wealthy, not only up to the point of the Laffer tax maximizing, revenue maximizing tax rate, but uh, beyond that in an effort to reduce rent-seeking. So I, it's, it's an internally coherent argument. I don't, I don't buy it all. There's a lot of stuff that has to be validated, a lot of stuff to look at. But it is, it's an interesting new way uh, to think about things. Having said that, I'm not ready to buy on to the wealth tax yet. For a lot of the reasons mentioned earlier, I think we can do a lot of the work of the wealth tax with uh, the existing system. I'm worried about the constitutionality of the tax. But I'm also worried about stuff, the, the, like mark to market, the, the, what Alan mentioned, generally sounds like a good idea. And then let me just give you the following example. Warren Buffett owns $50 billion in stocks. Um, we go into recession, the stock market, stock market falls by 10%. He loses $5 billion in stock value. If you have a fully mark-to-market system, he should get a rebate from the government of the tax rate times $5 billion during a recession. 
Okay, so if you're taxing, say, at the full 40% rate, he would get $2 billion in a check from the government. All right, I, that is not a desirable policy. <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't know, he's my this graduate. Is, this so is not to rule out mark to market. I'm sure there are ways to adjust, but all of these policies, uh, none of these policies are perfect. Uh, and so we should not let uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let me just give one more example here. People say the wealth tax is not administrable. Well, look at the income tax. Right? We have $500 billion in tax evasion every year, according to the IRS. That's, that's people Ill, illegally not paying their taxes. We have a massive industry devoted to avoidance, right? Uh, and whether it's estate tax or income tax or whatever. But we don't say, you know, is the income tax administrable? And I, I, so I think by standards of the income tax being administrable, the wealth tax likely is too. Now it's not perfect, but, but uh, I think it deserves a fair hearing. Okay, and before I turn to Maya, I'm just going to, so you can use uh, you know, your time to respond to the wealth tax issue, but also quickly, where do you think the fu what's the future of the TCJA? Are there things that can be made better? Uh, do you think that there are fixes to the TCJA? Nicole Keating, who wrote for our series, says that we need permanency in several provisions. Uh, Glenn, you mentioned a destination-based cash flow tax. I'm going to come around and ask you that. Um, and then get ready with your questions. So Maya, I'm going to turn to you. Okay, so on the wealth tax, I'll probably take a different emphasis, which is all the technical reservations aside, I think it's tremendous that we're having this kind of a discussion because I think if this country doesn't stay attuned to the fact that income inequality, lack of mobility, and economic insecurity are driving a whole lot of the anxiety um, at, which has led into our current political environment, hyper-partisanship, distrust, distract, being distracted from the bigger issues that are facing us, um, we will continue to fail to address the real policy things that we should be focusing on. So I think that discussion is critically important. I'm really disappointed that I think that the numbers that have been used to back it up were exaggerated and allocated in the wrong ways, which takes away from the discussion. In terms of revenues, I fully support new revenue measures. Um, and so I'm still on the wealth tax here. In terms of the distributional priorities, I agree that a more progressive tax code certainly makes sense for the economic environment we're in. And then in terms of administrat and I can't even say the word, administratability. <laughs> it's going to be tough to administer, so I think we should focus on finding other ways. But I think those objectives are really important ones to be talking about, and I think that should be the focus. In terms of what goes on from now, anybody who's still predicting anything is very gutsy. Um, I am not <laughs> one of those people. It clearly depends on where the political environment is down the road. I can promise one thing, which is Democrats will spend all the rest, you know, many, many years coming up saying, I'll just pay for that by repealing the tax cut. Yeah. And they will do that over and over again. And it's unfortunate because then you don't have the, we've created this environment where there's not the real discussion of how we pay for things. Um, quick side note that sort of on the notion that starve the beast works and we will cut taxes and that will then push us to look at these important things we have to do in controlling spending, the absolute reverse happened here, right? We cut taxes by almost $2 trillion that will be added to the debt. And that was quickly followed by not one, but two massive spending increases that are almost rival the tax cut in terms of additions to the debt. So, and that's what happened every time we've cut taxes since the mid 1960s. That's what happens. The star of the beast doesn't work, it breaks the dam, and it just leads to more borrowing. Right. So that's where we are now. So I know there will be fiscal pressure, but I doubt that it will end up being that the repeal, I think some of the tax cut will be repealed. Hopefully, some of it will be permanent just so we know what's going on. But we'll soon be talking about a whole new revenue source because we cannot possibly finance aging, the unmet investments, and all the demands that are out there unless there's more revenue. So to go next. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with that. I think in the short term, if you imagine just sort of a change in political control, what could happen, it's probably a modest increase in the corporate rate, maybe with the trade off of making some of the other business provisions permanent. Not sure about the individual side. But I'm still a, it's not just that I'm an economic fan of, I still think there will be serious consideration of the cash flow tax. And I think it for several reasons. One, it could be part of a plan with other taxes as a, a revenue raiser, but partly it gets at some of these distributional issues. The, the cash flow tax falls on rents, it falls on inframarginal returns. That's what part of what the left says their concerns about. It also gets at some of the issues of untaxed wealth. So whether you're coming at this from a 
economic efficiency perspective or from a quote fairness perspective, you're drawn to that. So I think we will have a serious budget discussion. The numbers suggest that and you can't rule out math. And I think the cash flow tax will be back on the table. So I hope you're right. The other advantage of the cash flow tax is that it, it makes moot all of these international uh, profit shifting issues that we've been talking about. I want to say two things about TCGA, one pass, and I want to make a forecast that I'm virtually certain is right. The thing about the pass <laughs> is that we haven't talked about it. TCGA was enormously unpopular with the public. It was less popular than some tax increases of recent years. Uh, and it's just, I just want to put that into the, into the hopper. The forecast that I will make that, I, that I'm virtually certain is right is TCJA will make it harder to fight recessions in the future. The tax system normally is an automatic stabilizer. Taxes go down. When income goes down, that kind of cushions the fall. When, tax, when the economy gets red hot and expands a lot, taxes go up and that, that takes away the punch bowl uh, somewhat. Uh, TCJ will make that automatic stabilizing function less effective. It does this in several ways. Lowering the corporate rate is the, the biggest one, but uh, the restrictions on net operating losses, which is a base uh, broadening thing that may not have made so much sense. Uh, the move to expensing and the limitation on interest deductions uh, will, again, reduce the cyclicality of the tax system and hence reduce the extent to which it cushions uh, declines uh, in income. And there are some features in FDII that I don't want to go through, but, but will have a similar effect. So uh, it's sort of a point that's gotten lost in the debate. But the next time we have a recession, uh, the tax system in general, and the corporate tax in particular, will serve less of an automatic stabilizer role uh, than it has in the past. And of course, the other way TCJ will make it harder to fight recessions is with a bigger budget deficit, policymakers may be more reluctant uh, to enact uh, new initiatives. I think the only thing you can really predict uh, reliably is that uh, we have more uncertainty than ever before. I think to have a policy like this that was adopted by one party uh, in a partisan, in an era of part partisan polarization, it really guarantees that uh, the fate of the law is going to depend upon who holds you know, the White House and who holds each chamber of Congress. I mean, if there's divided government, then it may be hard for any changes to be made, which of course doesn't mean the tax code stays static. It means that some of the provisions expire in 2025, some of the provisions become tighter over time and new provisions are introduced. You have this whole crazy quilt of effective dates in the uh, bill, uh, in the law. And so you just see all these changes, um, you know, taking place. So it's, uh, it, it, ideally you would like to see a serious effort made to improve the TCJA. For example, to really clean up some of these international provisions, especially the BEAT and the, and the FIT. Either get rid of them or you know, actually ideally get rid of those, but then maybe improve the guilty provision and so forth. Uh, the bipartisan cooperation to do that, I think, is just not there. The Democrats feel that because they were frozen out of the passage of this law, that they really are not you know, don't have a responsibility to help improve it. They point out that Republicans refused to help improve the Affordable Care Act after it was adopted, and so they're just following that same uh, practice. Um, so I think uh, it's not an ideal situation to be in. Okay, well, let's turn to audience questions. We're gonna collect two at a time so that uh, we can have the panelists respond to those. <coughs> You can start and then we'll have one. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, with respect to the corporate tax rate, there was a lot of talk be before it was enacted to reduce that the that would just be a race to the bottom, that our foreign competitors would reduce their tax rates. Has that happened? And uh, the second question is, uh, considering the loss of revenue from this, from this act, will that be the end of the argument that tax cuts fund themselves, pay for themselves? So I also have two quick questions. One is on the spending side. Uh, would appreciate commenting on efforts to make government more accountable on the spending um, and be more thoughtful. And second one is international um, effort. OECD has an effort to look at uh, international uh, profit shifting. Um, can you comment on any uh, initiatives uh, here uh, to help level the playing field for small and medium-sized enterprises versus multinationals? 
can choose to answer whichever question or all of them. I can try to take a quick stab. Um, the race to the bottom had already happened first. We were trying to catch up. <laughs> would be a quick way I would, would an answer that one. Uh, tax cuts never paid for themselves, but yet that line will always be used yeah. because there's always a market to hear it. Some tax cuts have bigger feedback effects than others, and corporate taxes are probably at the high end of that range, so it's probably a better thing to cut, but it certainly can't possibly pay for itself. Spending, you really, it's not just transparency. I've long been of the belief that we have to have a formal spending limitation. A rule, Tim Kaine and I proposed one in a book. You don't have to like that one, but there's a, in a system that we have, there's nothing else that's going to be a governor. The OECD effort, laudable, doubt it's going to go as far as if we just um, move toward the destination-based cash flow tax ourselves, in which case it's not even an issue. Yeah, just yeah, to so add I'm on the, the, another <laughs> advantage of the destination-based cash flow tax is um, it deals with the race to the bottom. It, 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 it basically stops the race to the bottom because the tax uh, is no longer the income that you declare or what you produce in a country. So it, it, it has the attractive feature that uh, uh, you don't have, it, it would, if we did it unilaterally, it would be, it would make us uh, essentially a tax haven, but we'd still collect revenues from it because it's not taxing income on the margin. So on, on tax cuts paying for themselves, sort of the ridiculous argument that we still continue to hear every couple months in an op-ed here or there is that, oh, revenues were higher this year than they <laughs> were last year. So look, the tax cuts have paid for themselves. And that's kind of the worst of obfuscating how, what, what would have happened otherwise, right? So that, that it, is, it clearly actually shows that um, revenues are significantly below what was being estimated before the tax cut, but that story has become completely um, mutilated in the telling of it. But I think it's right. There's always going to be a market for the tax cuts pay for themselves. And instead of that being put to rest, what you're going to hear is, oh, these spending investments pay for themselves. And you're going to hear that a lot on infrastructure and other things, which, again, very few of them pay for themselves. And they're less likely to if you debt finance them than if you actually pay for them. And in terms of the accountability and spending, uh, we've seen the opposite. So if you have no accountability on the revenue side, there's, it's not going to be met with accountability on the spending side. What we should be doing is reforming our health care programs, reforming our entitlement programs, and having spending caps on discretionary or the entire budget, the entire spending that we actually stick to or offset if we want to change them. But we don't have that at all. And you cannot have kind of a political playing field where you say, oh, I want smaller government, so I'm going to cut taxes instead of recognizing that if you want smaller government, you have to cut spending, and then expect that the other side is going to go along with that. So I think we are in an era of non-accountability on all sides of the budget that will probably persist, certainly through the election. Just time for one quick question. Um, yeah. uh, I'll try to make it. I'm on. I'll try to make it quick. I have a question for uh, Ms. McGinnis. You said something very interesting at the beginning of the session uh, about uh, increasing the transparency of the corporate tax uh, by cutting the tax rate on corporations. And I, uh, the way I look at it is that we have one tax on corporations at the corporate level and then another tax levied when dividends or buybacks are pushed out to tax holders and, or to shareholders. And it's actually the corporate level that we have the most transparency about the tax rate being paid because once those dividends and buybacks are pushed out to shareholders, we have no idea how much of them are being received by uh, non-taxable entities or foreign shareholders or taxpayers. So to increase that transparency at the, the basic level seems like if we're going to cut the, the tax rate at the corporate level, we'd want to raise the tax rate on shareholders or something like that. So I'd just like you to, to That's theorize that a little That's a good point. See that point. The point me. I was sort of making is that the incidence of the corporate tax isn't understood at all. And I just go back to my one of my graduate uh, teachers in tax policy who just starts with, you know, people pay taxes. Corporations don't pay taxes. People pay taxes. And that simple line and the lack of understanding. I certainly know as much as my friends love to sit around and talk about corporate tax policy with me, um, which is not at all. They have never, <laughs> they have never believed that explanation. And so I just mean the transparency of understanding how any policy affects us, 
despite who's paying it, it may be different by the incidences. Well, I think Pierre Delecto did make that point in a <laughs> presidential <laughs> campaign. <laughs> 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 and on that awesome yeah. note, yeah. please join me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>First, thank Aparna for organizing this important panel. Um, we were sitting at lunch and we were sort of feeling like, is anyone even listening to tax policy people anymore? Mm -hmm. And I have a 14-year-old child who is very willing to express skepticism about my career and other you know, things about my life. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart to everyone who is in this room um, that at least a few people are still listening to tax policy. Um, I agree with Maya. The blog series has just been really interesting and queued up a lot of um, great issues, um, including the one that we're going to talk about here today, which um, sort of narrowing in on, we had this big tax cut. It went through, you know, from, you know, the time it was dropped until the time it was passed was just lightning fast. And we never really took a breath to figure out um, what was going on because it was just moving so quickly. So I think it's great now to have that moment to take a breath. And we're going to talk about sort of the distributional impacts of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So it's always been the case that the federal income tax is used to redistribute income. And I think we want to discuss, um, you know, is that a, you know, the right amount of redistribution happening now and what is happening? So here today, um, um, I have Alex Brill, um, Len Berman, and Kyle Pomerlo. I'll give just a brief introduction. Um, 
Alex is a resident fellow here at AEI who previously served as a policy director and chief economist of the Ways and Means Committee. And he staffed the Simpson Bowles Fiscal Commission, if anyone remembers that, um, which was really important work, but shows that he's been in this game a long time. Len is an institute fellow at the Urban Institute, my own organization, and he's a co-founder of the Tax Policy Center. Um, he's a professor at the Maxwell School of Syracuse um, University and served as De Deputy Assistant Secretary of um, Tax Analysis at the Treasury. He's also been a mentor to me on many occasions, so I wanted to take the opportunity to publicly thank him for that. It's a true honor to sit on a panel with you. Um, Kyle is the Chief Economist and Vice President of Economic Analysis at the Tax Foundation, where he routinely breaks down these very complex concepts in order to improve public discourse. And he follows what's happening in the world of tax policy I think more than anyone else, and so it's just a delight to um, have his perspective on this panel. So like the last panel, I'm gonna ask a few questions and I'm gonna try to direct them a little bit, but I wanna encourage everyone to chime in at any moment, and if there's um, you know, ever people talking over each other, we can just do a quick arm wrestle and you know, figure out who gets to keep talking. Um, so, and then I also wanna say, I'm gonna save um, a little bit of time at the very end in case there's something that you're dying to say and it didn't come out, um, you'll have that opportunity. So uh, like Aparna, I sort of want to set the stage here. Um, there's just absolutely no consensus on what the distribution of federal taxes ought to be. Um, I think there's probably some agreement that taxes should be progressive, but how much progressivity there should be is certainly not something we've um, decided upon. So Kyle, you've written about the distribution of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act quite extensively. And I was hoping you could sort of just give a brief overview of what did federal taxes look like by way of distribution coming into the TCJA? What did the TCJA pile on top of that? And then if anyone else sees it a little bit differently, we can sort of clear up um, that before we proceed into a discussion of why that distribution matters. Yeah. That that's a lot of stuff. I'll try to keep it brief, and I have a couple of points here. So under previous law, generally speaking, the federal tax code was progressive. So you look at tax units with income over $1 million, they were paying an effective tax rate in excess of 32%, whereas taxpayers that were earning income below 40000 were facing effective tax rates a little less than 10%. But when you start drilling down more details at the very, very high end, progressivity starts slipping a little bit, and also looking at the very bottom, um, uh, effective tax rates are slightly higher um, there as well. And in looking at individual taxes, a, we ha the federal tax code has both regressive taxes, payroll tax, excise tax, and progressive taxes, the corporate income tax and the individual income tax, but, uh, and estate and gift taxes, but add it all together, a progressive system. So what did the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act do to that? Well, looking at just effective tax rates, really not that much in the grand scheme of things, but overall it did reduce the progressivity of the federal tax system. So looking at each income group, each income group did receive a tax cut um, in the aggregate, um, but the largest tax cut is a percent of after-tax income, or percent of income, or the change in after-tax income went to the top 1%. And, um, I estimated at about 3.8% increase in 2018 for the top 1%, where the bottom 20% got an increase of about 0.8%. So a big difference there. In the middle class, um, or middle quintiles, we're getting tax cuts of about between 1.5% or 1.6%. Uh, a couple points here to drill down into the details. So looking at the top, is driven a lot by the changes in business taxes. So I estimated about half of the benefit to the top 1% was due to the reduction in corporate tax revenue in 2018. The other half was due to the changes on the individual side. Um, and the business side was a bit, is a big effect, um, especially in the first year, because um, that's even with some of the base broadeners that targeted the top, such as the cap on the state and local tax deduction. Middle income households benefited from two things, and I think Alex will get into this because he wrote about this, but it, one, the rearranging of the family tax benefits and the rate reductions. Low income individuals, however, didn't get as much, um, and this was due to the limit on, um, or not really focusing on re expanding refundable tax credits. Um, 
And then the last point here I'll make is that, well, all of, most of this is temporary anyway. Um, so by the end of the decade, we're talking actually about tax increases for a lot of taxpayers. And this is due to the fact that uh, they were hitting that, tar that target to make it uh, roughly deficit neutral by the end of the 10 years. Um, and they did that effectively by paying for a slim corporate tax cut with a switch to chain CPIU on the individual side. Yep. Uh, just to clarify that last point, the switch to chain CPIU, chain CPI, which is a permanent provision, yeah. is actually a tax increase on low middle income yes. people, and it's one that grows over time. There are good reasons to change the price index, but it does mean that tax brackets are going to increase more slowly. The earned income tax credit is going to increase more slowly because they're adjusted by that index. A point I like to make, which is one that I imagine Bill would make if he were on this panel, is that we have no idea what the distribution of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is. And the reason is that it's a deficit finance tax cut. And Maya was focusing on why that's probably a bad thing, given that we're bankrupt. But the, another... <laughs> Uh, another, another drawback is that we don't know who's paying for it. We know that at some point, unless you think the tax cuts pay for themselves, that uh, there has to be less spending, more taxes, or some combination in the future, uh, or possibly a deficit crisis. Uh, and the concern is that the things that would be done to close the $2 trillion in additional deficits would have disproportionate effect on low and middle income people. And that's, I think that's a reason for concern. And I think you know, we've had this pattern for, you know, since the Tax Reform Act of 1986 of passing tax cuts and really not saying who's paying for them. And you say, well, we're um, going to cut, I mean, this came up in the last panel, but saying we're going to cut spending, and of course we never do that. Uh, I mean, I agree. I'll just add that, um, that, that we, can, we can estimate those things. I mean, we can mm -hmm. run scenarios. We don't know how we'll pay for these uh, things. But if we paid for these things with um, the wealth tax that was described in the last panel, we could see what the consequences of that would be versus yeah. if we paid for it with a, with a spending cut. I'd also add just, um, uh, I was reminded when Maya mentioned how people um, tend to complain more about the things they don't like than, than compliment the things they do like. Uh, uh, within these distributional analyses, of course, there are there's all sorts of different outcomes. Um, if you ask your physician or you ask your attorney um, how they feel about um, uh, if they got a tax cut, if they're in the 1%, they probably didn't, right? I mean, so it's different kinds of people earning different kinds of income. The, the caps on salt um, for many taxpayers um, uh, outweighs the effects of the reduction in the corporate tax rate. That may be, that may be good or that may be bad, but it's not a uniform effect within, uh, with any, within any of these groups. Yeah. So it strikes me that in um, prior tax reform efforts, there was a real emphasis on that distribution table, and there was very much a concern for um, low and middle income families in particular. And you know, provisions we would see get added toward the end that would sort of balance that table. But um, you know, your take on it, Kyle, is that table wasn't balanced in the end. And you know, a, a cynical me could say, you know, it was a Republican passed bill and the distribution just wasn't the top priority. But I think there are arguments which you have made, Len, about why. Um, everyone ought to care about um, the distribu have distributional concerns. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that the conventional wisdom has been that uh, distribution is a democratic issue and tax cuts are a Republican issue. And uh, in the past, we've had bipartisan efforts at tax reform or tax changes. and to basically to win over Democratic votes, we've done things to say expand the earned income tax credit or expand the child tax credit. That didn't happen this time. And there were some, some benefits for low income people. Kyle mentioned the increase in the child tax credit, but it was limited. And it was because of the effort of, I think, Marco Rubio and Mike Lee to try to get at least something for low income families with kids. So what's, what's wrong with that? So I'll, uh, if you're concerned about growth, you shouldn't care about inequality. I think that's exactly wrong. And I think we have a lot of evidence for how that can work out badly. Uh, in the United States, for the last 30 or 40 years, low and middle income people have felt like they've been falling behind. The extent to which they are falling behind is an issue of debate. 
Uh, there are economists like Bruce Meyer are saying, well, look, there are a lot of things are getting less expensive, and we're not really measuring prices right. But the fact is that you know, the disaffection of middle, the lower middle income working voters is a function of the fact that they see the economy growing. They see all of these things that people now perceive to be important parts of modern life, and they can't afford them. Or if they try to pay for them, they're in really serious financial straits. So I think it's time for people who care about growth to actually take distribution seriously. And you could do it because you care about poor people. That's, you know, but, or, or, or you could say, well, that's for the bleeding heart liberals. But you should do it because you care about growth. Because if you don't do things to make sure that the gains from economic growth are shared broadly, you will have, and I, I made this argument 10 years ago, uh, before I had particular faces to put to this, the, the, the prediction I was making. And I, I'm very sad that I was right. But I said, if you don't do anything about this, you're going to have populist demagogues. You're going to propose policies that are ostensibly aimed at working people that will actually make them worse off, make the economy grow more slowly, could ultimately hurt people at all income levels. And examples of policies like that would be trade restriction, uh, you know, trade wars, uh, immigration restrictions. I don't know who would do that. Uh, the, on the other side, uh, regulation, saying you don't like market outcomes, we will regulate them away. Uh, very, very high minimum wages, uh, requirements for employment in particular industries or other things that are aimed at helping vulnerable populations. And if economists don't do a good job of explaining uh, why, why, why working people are made worse off by these policies, and we don't, uh, then those policies could be very, very appealing. And I think it's, no, it's really no surprise that in the last election, a whole lot of interest was paid to people who are on the far left and far right who are pushing populist proposals. So I have, I, I have a paper proposing a wage subsidy that uh, if you look at real wages over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, those have been basically flat. And again, you can argue about, well, maybe they've grown a little bit, but uh, people have felt like their wages have not kept up. I actually talked to... I talked to a friend whose, whose sister lives in Wisconsin, and she said her sister had said, you know, she was not a Trump voter, but she was explaining the Trump voter phenomenon by saying that people here haven't gotten a raise in years, and they really want somebody who's going to address that. Hillary Clinton was proposing four more years of status quo. Uh, President Trump said, I feel your pain. I'm going to do something about it. Uh, so... A direct way to deal with this would be a wage subsidy, basically expanding the EITC so that it supports the wage of low and middle income people. And I have a proposal that does that in a way that actually would get rid of marriage penalties, would have other positive economic effects, and it would be paid for with a value added tax. We're talking political reality here. Uh, <laughs> but it, it would, you know, it would, taxes have effects on the economy, but this would have much smaller negative effects on the economy, I would argue, than. Uh, trade, trade wars or uh, onerous regulation. There are other proposals, universal basic income, uh, which uh, Andrew Yang has pushed. I think politically that's more challenging, uh, but it is another way of trying to share in the gains from economic growth. The other thing about the, the wage credit proposal that I, I've laid out is that the wage credit would be tied to the overall economy as VAT revenues increased the maximum credit would grow so that for the first time in 30 or 40 years, you could say to low and middle income people that they will be sharing in the gains from economic growth, even if the market doesn't do it by itself. Uh, I'm not saying that's the right solution, but I think it's a discussion that is overdue and that we better engage in soon before we get a more competent demagogue in the world. Kyle? Yeah, I just want to add, um, so I, I think a lot of the discussion about you know, equity efficiency it kind of implies there's just one, this one-to-one -one trade off, but I think there, in, you know, along some dimensions, yeah, yeah, there are. So if we wanted to make the tax code more progressive by hiking the top tax rate, the statutory tax rate, yeah, we can discourage labor force participation, hit investment, and you know, encourage some bad behaviors, uh, tax avoidance behaviors, but 
I think that you know, other uh, policies can both, you know, there can be an increase in efficiency and also um, have a more progressive tax code overall. I mean, my favorite one to point to is I think um, roughly, like a cash flow tax, for example, I think is m a more progressive source of revenue, holding revenue constant than, say, a traditional corporate income tax, because the traditional corporate inco income tax falls on investment and eventually wages where a cash flow tax may not do the same. So I don't think it's, I, I think the, the debate is not always in a very useful place where it's always this trade-off. I think there are ways to make the tax code better in both ways at the same time. I'd just add that, um, you know, I, I, I think it was maybe it was a straw, a straw man that you, that you put forward that, you know, this is the Republican view is that we got to give the tax cuts to, to the rich and not to the to the middle income. Uh, th there is a change in the distribution of, of federal income tax as a result of the bill. It's pretty difficult to do a bill that doesn't have some impact on the change in the distribution of federal income tax. I do think that Republicans um, thought about this. We can debate or disagree. It may or may not meet our preferences or your preferences or my preferences, but I don't think that it's a it's happenstance. Um, if you go back to the sort of the blueprint, what they called the hashtag better way plan, if folks can remember the, that brief iteration through this process, um, uh, a considerable amount of change was being proposed. I mean, this idea of doubling the standard deduction, putting a lot, a lot more people on a standard deduction versus itemizing, it's going to change people's tax liability. It's going to change when people begin to pay federal income tax. Uh, those parameters weren't sort of willy-nilly picked. Um, if, you, if you ask the question, you know, when would someone start to pay income tax, um, you know, they were very carefully balanced um, to, to, with consideration. Uh, again, it may not be everyone's preference. I think sometimes we confuse in the debate um, what the progressivity is of the federal income tax versus what the change in the progressivity is of the, of the federal income tax. And there are, there are some voices that think that every change needs to be progressive, which is different from saying that the system needs to be progressive. Yeah, and I, I, will st I, I do think that um, Republican lawmakers did care about the distributional tables um, quite a bit. Um, and I, I mean, the way they got around uh, you know, making tough choices about the distributional tables is to have a revenue negative tax, uh, you know, a tax cut so they can just, you know, get around having to take money from one group and give it to another in a way. I have a question for Alex, actually. Uh, there is bipartisan support for expanding the earned income tax credit for low income, low income individuals and families without custodial children. Which was and, in the better way. Yeah, and I wonder why I, I wonder why that hasn't gained more traction. It seems like it would be a good way to reach out and say you really care about uh, getting low-income men in particular into the workforce. I mean, there are all sorts of positive effects from that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I wasn't in that, that's, <laughs> that smoky backfield room. Um, <laughs> I would guess perhaps that uh, that, that might have been a policy that would have been accepted if Democrats had been willing to come on board. <laughs> um, strategies like that have been pursued in the past. Mm -hmm. So in general, Alex, you've been a little bit less pessimistic about the TCJA than others, um, which is good. It's good to have optimistic voices. Um, but I, so it's always been the case that um, low-income families have received substantial s subsidies in the tax system, and it's still the case. Um, but you wrote a little bit about how those were maybe leveled off or, or big enough, and I wondered if you could talk about, like, is there sort of a right level that we ought to be targeting for these subsidies? Are they too big? Was this a good correction that was made? Yeah, so there's been, um, I think, a long history um, of uh, when large tax bills are enacted, uh, that a portion of that uh, tax, uh, those tax changes um, accrue to uh, uh, families, families with children more so than, uh, than singles or, or those without children. Um, in the recent histories, we can think about uh, 1997 when uh, President uh, Clinton um, and, uh, you know, led the way on the child tax credit. The first time we had a child tax credit, $500. President Bush took it to $1,000. Now it's at, at $2,000. That sort of overstates the impact because, of course, in the last bill, there were other changes that were made at the same time. So, so the, it's not literally $1,000 more for every child. But um, in the, in the, as what you're alluding to in the blog post that I wrote in this series, uh, looked at, at the end of the day, what is the impact, what is the change in the, as a result of TCJA uh, for families versus non-families, for singles versus uh, married, one kid versus two kids versus three kids. 
Um, and, and the result is, is that um, uh, taxpayers who uh, have more kids and taxpayers who are married versus single are on average getting more tax relief uh, than, than those who don't. So having more kids means, uh, at the end of the day, more tax relief. Why? Um, well, in large part, it has to do with the increase in the child tax credit. Um, but it's a push and pull. Uh, the, the repeal of the personal exemption uh, goes the other way. Um, and other changes, um, the reduction in rates, are obviously contributing a lot to this. Um, uh, as I looked at this, uh, I looked at it on average, and I looked at it among the middle income quintiles, um, again, by single and married, and, and depending on the number of kids. And those larger families and those married families are, are getting more tax breaks. That's a separate question. That, that's just sort of how it plays out. Now, your other question is, is like, is that right? Is that good? Did they do enough? You know, I, I don't know. I, in my view, uh, I don't think that every time we change the tax code means that, um, that families with children get to go to the bank and get a tax cut. I, I think that if we play that forward um, and change the tax code as often as we do, uh, we will have a, a system where families um, are completely excluded from the income tax. Um, but people disagree with this. Um, pe people here at AEI, my colleague uh, Ramesh Panuru, uh, disagrees with this a lot and thinks that, um, that the, the tax cut didn't strike the right balance and that there should be more tax relief uh, for families. So just to sort of pick up on a point Len made earlier that we don't know what the ultimate distribution is because it's deficit financed. Is there reason sort of to pair your, like, it's fine in the tax system. Can we pair that with optimism that it's not going to land at the feet of low and middle income families, the price tag eventually? Or is that a step too far? <laughs> I don't know how they're going to pay for this. Yeah. Uh, um, no, I, I think the point that Len made and the point that Bill's made before I think is an important one. We need to think about how, how these things are ultimately financed. Um, there's, there's, there's no question. Um, and if we think about financing them through um, you know, on the spending side versus on the tax side, if it's a VAT or if it's changes in Social Security, um, th these things don't. These things matter, and, and, and we don't know. We we can uh, we can speculate and run scenarios and, and show the importance of this point, but but we don't we don't know until that day comes. Yeah. I well, um, when I moved to D.C., um, you know, the big thing that was going on was the fiscal cliff or the expiration of the Bush tax cuts. Um, so that that might be where I I would start here um, now. That wasn't fully financed. Um, that was just offsetting a portion of that. But that, that's, that's also another possibility. So it, it depends on who's in office at the point when, you know, say, the individual provisions are about to expire and lawmakers really need to think about that. I think the makeup of Congress and the White House is going to matter a great deal. So um, can, can I make yeah, one more please. point about the, the, the fiscal cost? Um, we, we've been describing this bill, as everyone has, as a bill that costs one to two trillion dollars in the next decade. I, I think we really need to, when we think about this financing question, we really need to be thinking about the long run cost of this bill. And my, my view, if, if we passed a tax bill that reformed the corporate income tax and, and had a whole bunch of changes and made a system better, and, and that costs something um, in the short term, I, I might sort of say that's fine. Um, I would think much more about what the 10th year cost is than what the 10 year cost is. Um, and I think that when we, that, you know, that when we think about the financing this at the end of the day, we need to distinguish between um, policies that have a short term limited cost and versus a permanent cost. Well, the 10th yeah. tenth, tenth year cost is almost surely higher than we scored it though because, sure. you know. No, no, I wasn't arguing that it was, I mean, that it was I mean, okay. even, <laughs> even, yeah, I mean, even if they're Democrats controlling Congress in 2025, it's basically set up just like the Bush tax cuts and say, well, we'll, you know, we'll keep the parts that help low and middle income people and we'll raise tax rates back up to where they were for high income people. So, you know, Clinton, or not Clinton, uh, Obama, Obama, Obama rent, you know, said that the Bush tax cuts were wildly irresponsible and we couldn't afford them and therefore he was going to continue almost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just so not. I like your perspective that we need to think about these things long term, even if there's a short term cost. And one um, thing that strikes me is even if it cost more today, if we got a tax system that was simpler, more fair, it might be worth it. So I wondered if anyone could comment on, did we get a simpler tax system? Did what we traded, was it, was it worth it maybe? I think that... Um in some sense, we shifted the complexity of the tax code up the income spectrum. So, so I think the virtual doubling of the standard income tax of the standard deduction 
is uh, both a, a dramatic increase in the simplicity of the tax code for many people in the middle class, as well as an increase in the fairness of the system. Um, uh, people who are neighbors with each other are more likely to be paying the same uh, tax um, uh, today than they would otherwise because um, uh, far more people are taking the standard deduction. Um, but the tax code also becomes more complex in other parts of, this, in other parts of the system, for, perhaps for higher income uh, taxpayers. Yeah, the simplification you got from it, uh, basically cutting, you know, slashing the number of people who are itemizing deductions was, that is a meaningful simplification and one which the beneficiaries are uniformly unhappy about because uh, <laughs> they don't get to take their charitable deductions, their mortgage interest deductions anymore. But they pay uh, less tax. Yeah, I know. Uh, but they're still, they're still really, really angry about the salt cap. Uh, that I think I, I would love for tax reform to be an opportunity to simplify, and it certainly could be. Could be. Uh, you think about Tax Reform Act of 86, which was the holy grail of tax reform for some of us. And I remember the first version of that was called Tax Reform for Fairness, Simplicity, and Economic Growth. The second one was called Tax Reform, the President's Proposals for Tax Reform for uh, Growth, uh, fairness and simplicity, and the thing that was ultimately enacted didn't really make things much simpler at all. Then, you know, just raising a standard deduction by itself doesn't make that much difference because people, I mean, subtracting one number versus another number from your AGI doesn't make that much difference. But there are things that could be done. And the thing that I would love to do would be to move towards a, a pay as you earn return free system, like in the UK, where a lot of low and middle income people wouldn't have to file income tax returns. And I think there are big advantages to that. One is that it would make compliance with the tax system, basically tax day wouldn't be an event for those people. Uh, the second thing is I think it would actually serve as a bulwark against the complexities that policymakers feel uh, this great compulsion to add into the code. You know, you basically you get rid of all these loopholes and preferences, and then policymakers say, "Well, you know, I'm going to do things for you." And typically, they involve making things more complicated. If you if you want to have a system that's simple enough that half or more of households don't have to file income tax returns, you have to get rid of things like itemized deductions, uh, and probably deductions generally. In the in the UK, uh, they don't have traditional retirement accounts because they involve a deduction on the front end, taxation on the, the back end. They have what are basically Roth IRAs. They don't call them IRAs for historical reasons, but, uh, but they're really, really simple. There's no deduction in the front. There's no tax on the back end. Uh, subsidy for charity goes directly to charitable institutions, which might, I mean, I don't know of evidence on this, but actually might be a more effective way to encourage giving because you give money to charity and they say, well, we're going to, at a 20% match or whatever it is at the time you make the donation. It doesn't require filing, filing a return. So that's the kind of thing that could be done. The fact that we never actually get very far in simplification maybe suggests that people don't care that much about it. Well, your first point is that it would make people unhappy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the other thing, I, I think actually one of the insights of the Bush tax reform panel was... You know, they got rid of itemized deductions, and they uh, said, you know, turned some, some of the deductions into above-the-line deductions and got rid of the rest of them. They thought, well, wow, that's making things a lot more complicated, uh, rate, maybe raising taxes for some people. But I think if you have a deduction, the fact that it seems to be available for one group and not for another, you can explain until you turn blue in the face that the reason you don't get the deduction is because you get the money for free, and you don't have to keep your records is, is a challenge. So it actually might be, more, might be more actually sustainable if you had a system where if there's a deduction, anybody could take it, or, or there, there'd be the same credit for everyone. So we have just a few minutes before um, turning to questions. So um, please get questions ready. And I want to give everyone a couple minutes to sort of give closing remarks. And if there isn't something that's on the tip of your tongue that you want to talk about, I'll just pepper it with um, also pointing out, you know, Zuckman and Saez's new book. They say <laughs> that, you know, the TCJA made it so people at the top were actually paying lower rates. And I think there was some skepticism um, you know, from the earlier panel about that, but I would um, welcome thoughts on that. Um, we'll start with Kyle. 
Yeah, I, I can offer some skepticism of that result. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think I think you know overall the what they're doing is a very useful exercise. But I mean, it's it's driven. You know, the results you're going to get is they're going to be driven by the assumptions you make. And in doing this exercise, it requires a lot of assumptions about how you allocate income and how you allocate taxes. Um, and I'll, I think I'll point to three things, and some people have already pointed to these things that may, one, overstate the effective tax rate at the bottom, understate the effective tax rate at the top, or at least under, overstate the decline in the tax rate at the top. Um, so the first is I mean, it doesn't measure income the way that standard distributional tables measure income. So it's looking at a measure of national income, which is just effectively economic income that individuals are earning, not looking at transfer payments, um, even though we typically look at transfer payments because it's something that increases the after-tax or the after-tax income of households or your ability to consume, um, and that's usually included in distributional tables. And this is one of the big reasons why their tables differ a lot from a joint committee table or a tax policy center table. Two, their treatment of the corporate tax, I think, drives a lot of the 2018's result in particular, in that they allocate the entire corporate tax to just shareholders of corporations instead of allocating that more traditionally to all owners of capital, which is more equally distributed than corporate equity, or to capital and um, labor. And this pushes the effective tax rate, um, or the drop in the effective tax rate after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I think, a lot, because one of the centerpieces of that law was a big corporate tax cut. And I think also that that specific measure kind of overstates the, the long-term benefit of the corporate tax cut, because expensing, at least looking at just the, the cash flow effect, is a lot of a timing effect. So you go five years out, even assuming expensing is permanent, that benefit as they would measure would be much smaller. And then three, I think that they're overstating the effective burden of the bottom in the way that they tra treat the sales tax. They allocate 70% of the sales tax based on current mm -hmm. consumption, um, which has some problems when you're looking at the life cycle effects of people that earn income, save, and then consume in the future. And I think uh, actually Tax Policy Center handles this the right way by allocating um, sales taxes in a more reasonable way. And that last piece, the sales tax, actually interacts with the fact that they don't have transfers in their measure in that they get taxpayers that are paying infinite effective tax rates at the bottom end because people are consuming out of current transfer payments, um, but that's not being counted as income. So you have any positive tax liability from the sales tax is causing you to divide by zero and shooting the tax rate all the way up into infinity, um, which is not a result you really want. I mean, they... They kind of get around this problem by chopping off their sample at half the minimum wage, but I think that they could get a better result if they went with a different method of allocating the sales tax. It is also bizarre that they don't treat refundable tax credits as reductions in tax liability. I mean, they're they are following the budget scoring rules, but there's nothing you can do for low-income people before through the income tax before after after their income tax is zero, except through refundable credits. Mm -hmm. And they also this weird thing, they, they treat health insurance premiums as taxes, or is that a separate? That's a separate, a separate point thing that they make was, near the end of the yeah. book. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the, the basic point that the tax system has become less progressive over time, I think is right. Uh, you can argue about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, the, point, the point actually underlying their low effective tax rate at the top the part that's right about it is there's a lot of heterogeneity. If all of your income comes from capital gains, this is the Warren Buffett story, your tax rate's going to be low. Most capital gains aren't even realized in a year. If you hold them until death, you don't pay any tax at all. Uh, and if you sell them, they're taxed at half the rate of other income. Uh, there are a lot of high-income people who earn income from working or from things that are fully taxed, and they, they can pay very, very high tax rates. I think. Uh, I think Alex actually mentioned this, but one thing that should be a subject for a future tax reform is thinking about just the heterogeneity in taxation. And there's just so much variation at every income level. Uh, for example, low-income single men without kids uh, might have tax liability, uh, whereas the same person, if they had a, a child living at home with them qualifying for the ITC, 
child tax credit could have a big refund. Uh, you have to think about whether that makes sense as a matter of policy. There are a lot of, uh, I, I think you know, Glenn talked about you know, reducing differences across people uh, from the treatment of itemized deductions. And you, know, you have to think about whether saying the person who takes a home mortgage interest deduction should pay lower taxes than somebody who's renting the same house makes sense or not. Uh, but indirectly, I think they're kind of raising some really interesting issues, really indirectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, um, well, they get an A-plus on marketing. Uh, certainly, they're driving the conversation last week and this week and the week before. Um, I think that they're asking um, an important question. I think this is a question that needs to be studied. And the, and the biggest takeaway that I've, uh, for, for me, from this, um, uh, from this conversation that they've started is how difficult uh, it is to measure um, the distribution of income and the distribution of, of taxes. Um, this is not federal income tax divided by AGI on a bunch of tax returns, um, nor should it be. Um, it's a much uh, broader measure. Um, uh, they're right to try to think about national income and, and the trillion dollars of, of income that doesn't show up on tax returns and to ask the question about where should we put that income. Um, and, and the answer is we don't really know how to do that. Um, their results are, are outliers among the other estimates. Um, I'm a, an admirer of the work uh, by Jerry Otten and David Splinter um, who have been also working on this. Um, they don't have quite the marketing campaign um, <laughs> uh, behind their efforts, but they're doing very careful, and I would say, I would note also very transparent, very clear and transparent work on this, uh, explaining their own results and comparing their results um, to, to Saez and Zuckman, and getting very different answers. Um, uh, not only is the income tax uh, uh, in total uh, progressive by their measure, um, but they don't find the time trend that we see in the Zuckman result, uh, and Saya's result. And I think that their work uh, is, is important, and I think that we, and I'm not saying that it's, it's perfect either, but I'm saying that, we need, that this is an important topic that we need to be digging into, and we need to be digging into it more carefully. All right, with that, I would um, welcome questions, and I'll take uh, two at a time, just like the first panel. I think there's... Uh, well, maybe you can help me, but uh, I don't see the significance of the standard deduction because let's say the standard deduction is $12,000, so you don't pay any taxes up to $12,000. So you may as well start the table at $12,000. In other words, it's just a question of publishing new tables every year. The standard deduction doesn't really do anything. Uh, the other thing is I don't see how cutting taxes helps the GDP or unemployment because all it does, it keeps the money supply the same, so you're just recircling the same money. The purchasing power stays the same, and the spending stays the same because the government spends it. As a matter of fact, those who get the tax cut may spend it on imports or may speculate in the stock market, where the government accumulates large sums of money and is able to invest it in, say, buying airplanes from Lockheed, which increases employment. So I don't see the point or the advantage of cutting taxes. All right, and then there's one back here, too. Uh, it's mostly for Alex, but you know, Republican uh, comments on taxes since for the past 22 months have basically been a combination of we did it and maybe we should cut middle class taxes by 10%. So like, what should be sort of a positive uh, forward-looking agenda for Republicans on tax policy? All right, why don't we start with Alex and go toward Kyle. Um, so yeah, the, the, there, I, I had forgotten that. There was this discussion. Uh, we were gonna, right before the last election, we were gonna do another tax cut. Um, uh, <laughs> By tweet, I, I think a lot of that <laughs> drove a lot of that discussion. Um, um, so some of this was, you know, it was mentioned at the last panel. Um, you know, Alan was making the point about the need for technical corrections. Obviously, that's not a campaign slogan. Um, when we think more broadly, um, but an important issue, I don't mean to dismiss it. Um, when we think more broadly about the the future of the tax code, um, you know, I, I think that there will need to be a discussion going forward uh, about ways to raise more revenue, not just ways to, to collect less revenue over time. And that has to do with the, the fiscal pressures um, that we know we'll be facing 
um, over the next few years. And then the question is, is should we try to do that um, through the same structures that we have, um, or should we try to do that through, through new structures? Um, I think that there are opportunities for exploring new structures. Um, I've talked about this and written about this in the context of a carbon tax, as it could be a, a tool that could um, both generate revenues, um, either to offset the costs of making these tax cuts permanent or to offset the costs of some of our um, expected future spending obligations. Just on the question of how tax cuts could affect the economy, I, I think one thing we're lucky about is that taxes, that the economy seems to be relatively robust with respect to having a bad tax system, because if we needed a good tax system to grow, we would have been in a depression for the last 100 years. Uh, but, I mean, there, there are, obviously there, there are things the tax code can do that would improve growth. That's came up in the last panel. Uh, if it improves incentives to invest or makes uh, or removes distortions uh, favoring one kind of investment over another kind of investment, that could raise productivity, uh, which would be good for the economy over time. Uh, a carbon tax uh, would, would, might not show up in measured GDP, but it would actually make the economy work better uh, because it would align uh, incentives of individuals and businesses with the damage they're doing to the environment. Uh, so taxes, taxes can, and taxes can affect people's decisions to work or not work. I think one of the attractions of uh, increasing the EITC for non-custodial fa non fathers, for example, is it would get more of those people in the workforce. It wouldn't probably have a very big effect on GDP because they have relatively low wages, but it would be a plus, and it would be a really big plus for their families. I think going forward, um, for I think looking at Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you should be looking at the business side and what's, what stuff there needs to be made permanent. Um, on the individual side, it will be a big question, you know, what, what stays, what goes, what's sustainable, um, you know, with or without additional um, sources of revenue. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I, adding one small point to lens is the nice thing about, you know, looking at tax policy and how it affects incentives is like at the end of the day, you keep revenue collections constant and you fix the structure of the tax code, you can get additional output. Um, so you don't ha necessarily have to give up um, federal revenue to, to get anything there. I have time for one more question if there's, um, I'll come to the side of the room. Yeah, it's Carl Polzer. Just an observation first that it appears that conservative tax experts have horizontal lines on their socks, where <laughs> liberal ones have vertical, but it's just for the next meeting. But I just wondered if you're going to have a, a wealth tax in this country, don't you have to, for political reasons, wouldn't you have to have some, you know, really be clear, get clear consensus about how it's going to be spent? Um, and, you know, um, the other thing that puzzles me is we have wealth taxes in this country that play a large role in education funding. They're very regressive <coughs> at the local and state level. So, you know, it would be interesting to look into that. As, and also that's constitutional, piggybacking a federal tax on that. To, like a liberal might want to gather a lot of money from wealthy regions and redistribute it to, you know, less wealthy regions to, to improve the education system. And I guess in history that I've read, it, the way that taxing the residents seems to be the most practical way, proxy way to, to gauge somebody's wealth that you can get at. But anyhow, that's just a couple questions. Len, you want to take a stab? Uh, I actually push back at the first point, which is that you should pay attention to how the wealth tax is being spent. Uh, the, there, there are issues about what, you, what the government should be doing, what its spending is, and then what's the best way to raise the revenue. And for political reasons, it might be worthwhile to earmark something for a particular purpose. But I think evaluating wealth taxes and other taxes just on their merits, and accounting for the fact that we do need to raise revenue, uh, uh, I think that's, 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 that's the right approach. That said, uh, you shouldn't let candidates get away with saying they're going to use the wealth tax to pay for 20 different things. 
uh, when they're, I mean, if, if they're making an argument that they're going to be fiscally responsible, the numbers actually have to balance in total. You can't spend the same money multiple times. And as far as the socks go, you shouldn't draw inferences based on n equals three. <laughs> Anyone else? So with that, I will close. Um, it was such a delight when Aparna asked if I would moderate this panel. I always learn things when I'm here at AEI, and I tried to be a very neutral moderator, and so I'm keeping my socks covered. And I um, hope you all have a great day. Thanks for coming.